Thank you, MK. Good morning to all of you. And a very warm welcome um, to IDFC Alternatives Annual Infrastructure Conference. Um, uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, fortuitous uh, that we are gathering in December, first week of December. Um, it's been almost six months that the new government has been in power. And it has given us um, at least uh, some better sense um, of what to expect. So what I wanted to do very briefly is to um, share with you, uh, actually go from the very general um, big picture to the very specific. So I wanted to share with you uh, a perspective on what MK has just called the turn of the tide. Um, um, uh, my take on what we all can expect over the next few years um, in India, um, and then turn to the exciting times that IDFC itself uh, is now faced with and explain to you what that means for us and for IDFC alternatives. So on the uh, turn of the tide, um, <coughs> I mean, it's, everybody is acutely aware how this government has raised expectations. And um, one of the concerns that a number of people have expressed is that having raised these expectations, um, is it not likely that they will disappoint us? Um, because people are expecting the moon um, from, from this new government. Um, <clears throat> So I wanted to uh, argue to you that um, um, uh, what we are seeing happen in political terms uh, in this country represents now a very fundamental shift that for the next um, five years at least, if not 10, um, is going to, we expect, a very materially change um, the trajectory of business in this country. So, uh, two, three things. Um, first, about uh, this government. Um, they are non-ideological. Um, and they are very deep pragmatists. Um, so, if you are looking, or people who have been looking for a very well-defined sophisticated program of reforms in the sense that you know we've come to understand it um, those people have been questioning and have been a little disappointed in fact what they've done is they've focused intensely on process you're all business people here you understand that when you inherit a burning platform actually the vision thing is only five percent of what you have to do 95 percent is about changing attitudes and processes uh, what we have seen is a dramatic change in the way central government is actually running. Um, the level of coordination, the level of communication, the responsiveness of various government departments um, has changed very dramatically over the last six months. Um, and there is a, a longer term um, uh, initiative um, that is unfolding, which is to try and change the colossus that is the government, um, its attitude towards business generally. So you, you must have all heard about the Make in India campaign. Uh, the Make in India campaign, at least to me, is not as significant for the particular projects it will launch, but it is very significant for the process that it has launched of simplifying government procedure and making government at all levels more responsive um, to, the, to the needs of government. And because, um, again, as managers we all understand, because this is a, a, a soft task, it is difficult to keep a handle on, but it is extremely important, and it is an enterprise and initiative that was really largely ignored um, by previous governments. So this is a very first important point. Second um, point I'd make about um, this government is that um, they bring a very uh, uh, new dimension, a new perspective to interaction with state governments. 
Now, Mr. Modi, having been uh, a chief minister of a state, a very successful chief minister of a state, um, um, has introduced this uh, notion which is now being called cooperative or collaborative federalism. Um, and in a nutshell, what it means is that he understands what deals need to be cut with state governments uh, in a manner that empathizes with state governments that will make a number of important reform measures possible. So uh, the most important one of these is the general sales tax. Uh, the general sales tax uh, requires a give and take between the central government and the state governments because the state governments are fearful that they will lose revenue. Um, the previous government uh, did not have the, either the political capital or the sophistication, if you like, um, uh, to, uh, to engage in this dialogue with, with, uh, with said state governments in order to arrive at a negotiated settlement. Uh, I think all the signs are that in a matter of months, uh, we will actually see the general sales tax uh, be implemented. Um, and that will be a very, very important step in creating uh, a national integrated market, which today, um, as we all know, is very fragmented. So cooperative federalism and what it means for, again, the functioning of a number of initiatives. So for infrastructure, for example, and for the type of investments that we do, the supply chain networks, um, logistics management, these were business models uh, that were totally underexploited, uneconomic in our country because of the fragmentation of the economic space. With the introduction of the GST, um, we expect that that will be changed. Another very important thing that in this, in this domain the government is doing is moving the discretion of spending from on, on central government transfers, funds that are transferred from central government, the discretion of spending those funds is going to move from the central government. It was previously controlled by the Planning Commission in what had become a very combative, difficult interaction with state governments. That uh, discretion to spend will move to the state governments. Buys central government a huge amount of goodwill and facilitates dialogue on important reform measures. Um, third and, and final point I'd like to leave with you on, on, on the big picture. Um, I started um, you know, this articulation by saying that um, this government is a government of pragmatists. They are not ideologues, they're, they're not ideological. But if you um, pass through their vocabulary, there is actually a very important and fundamental shift that has taken place relative to the last 10 years. So there is no government in this country that can ever come to power or remain in power um, without being pro-poor. That goes without saying. But the important change in vocabulary in this government, and this is very significant to my mind, is that they are not at all shy of arguing that they are pro-business, but also pro-poor. The previous government had difficulty actually saying that. They ended up saying that they were pro-poor, um, and there were some technocrats that were a small group of you know, individuals in the last government who, who kept saying that they were pro-market, but in fact, behaved in a manner that was anything but. So three important, very fundamental changes. Um, um, uh, which are unfolding as we speak. Um, this will translate um, in the very near future into concrete reform measures that you and I can, can recognize and point to as, oh, now this is a substantive reform. Um, but uh, behind the scenes and below that, there is a much more important uh, momentum an initiative that has been building, which is, as I, as I said, that sort of changing, streamlining process and changing attitudes within government. Uh, so, so much for the big picture. Now, let me turn um, quickly to um, um, IDFC and the context in which we are operating. Um, we have, as IDFC, um, ridden the wave 
of private participation in infrastructure to a large degree. And if you reflect back on the last 10, 15 years, or 15 years of, of, of that phenomenon, um, in retrospect, um, it has been perhaps um, a, a case of um, um, too much too soon. Um, you know, the, the pace at which private enterprise has been invited into delivering infrastructure services um, in a country as large as ours has been unprecedented in international terms. So in the power sector, for example, um, about 30% of generating capacity from almost nothing 15 years ago is now in private hands. Uh, so that's the glass half full. But what are the challenges uh, that we are facing right now? The challenge is then the glass half empty, and this is why I say it might have been a case of too much too soon, and the power sector is a good example. While we open generation, electricity generation to private participation, at the two extreme ends of the electricity supply chain, downstream um, in terms of electricity distribution, all the assets remain essentially in public hands, and that too at the level of, uh, of the states, of the provinces. And upstream, in terms of fuel supply, fuel is very largely controlled by a state monopoly. Uh, the dominant fuel in this country remains coal and will for the foreseeable future, but coal is the monopoly preserve um, of Coal India. And it is the interaction between the middle, which is increasingly in private hands, and the extreme ends that are dominated and controlled by government, right? That conflict has created um, what has become a big mess, right? So uh, we have, uh, uh, I'll give you very broad numbers. Um, 250,000 megawatts of capacity that is operating. There's another 50,000 megawatts of capacity that is expected to uh, become operational in another couple of years. It's well in construction. Of this 300,000 megawatts, about a third, 100,000 megawatts, is in some way compromised. Um, uh, and about 20% of operating capacity is compromised. Almost all the capacity that is in construction is compromised. What do I mean by compromised? What I mean by compromised is that it is stressed in the sense that these projects are having difficulty servicing their debt. The implications for the financial system of this are enormous. We are talking about close to um, uh, 50, 60 billion dollars worth of debt um, that may be stressed or compromised. And the resolution of this prob problem now relies, uh, now uh, requires very complex um, distribution of pain between the equity holder, the creditor, and the final consumer. And of course, this process is, uh, is done in a very transparent and very um, um, cacophonous um, political, political system um, such as ours. So the politics of the situation is that governments will be very reticent to allocate a share of this pain um, to consumers. Uh, so there'll be a lot of pressure on both the banks and the equity owners to take as much of this pain um, um, as possible. This actually uh, uh, is, again, is something that the government is extremely focused on, and you will hear Mr. Piyush Goel later today, um, who will talk about it. Um, uh, the number of initiatives they are focusing on that will, we expect, begin to resolve these issues, and in the process, actually create um, a huge opportunity um, for the type of investment um, that we do. I expect that um, given the good sentiment and all the trends that I've been talking about, 
um, that the CapEx cycle will revive outside of infrastructure, creating investment opportunities outside of infrastructure. Um, and then within infrastructure, there will be lots of opportunities to help clean up, to recapitalize the assets that I have described as stressed um, and troubled. In this context, IDFC, as MK uh, explained a few months ago, um, got a, a provisional banking license. There are only two provisional banking licenses that were awarded by the Reserve Bank of India um, after 10 years. Uh, so we are the first recipients um, of a bank license in 10 years. And a lot has changed in 10 years, um, particularly in technology. So the cost of technology has come down, connectivity across the country has deepened and broadened very significantly. Regulations have become more supportive of the use of technology in banking. We now have created an infrastructure for domestic um, payments clearance. Um, some of you may have heard about the unique identification um, ID program, the Aadhaar program as it is called. This has uh, made uh, KYC norms and know your client uh, processes much easier and creates a lot of opportunities. So the way we are looking at, um, um, at our banking license is that it actually creates um, a huge potential for a bank or a group like ours that has no legacy, no branch network, very few employees, no legacy technology platform. The opportunity to actually create um, a franchise that is potentially disruptive in the market. And we believe that technology will be the backbone of the new IDFC bank. It will help us connect with customers um, in, in ways that do not necessarily rely just on branches, much more effectively than existing banks are able to do. And second, it will allow us to build a franchise, we believe, at a much lower operating cost than existing banks. So we are very excited about this uh, transformation. It is uh, uh, not the easiest of transformations to, um, uh, to execute um, because what it means is structural changes to the legal structure that is IDFC. Today, IDFC, which is the parent of IDFC alternatives, is a listed entity and it is um, regulated as a non-bank finance company. Once the transformation into the bank is complete, what will happen essentially is that IDFC Limited will become just a holding company, a bit like the bank holding companies in the United States. And the bank, as well all of the existing subsidiaries of IDFC will sit underneath this holding company, right? So, uh, uh, the parent of uh, IDFC alternatives over the next ten, ten months will will not be a balance sheet um, of any kind, but will just be a non-operating holding company. So um, that, uh, from the regulator's perspective, allows us to ring fence um, the banking operations. Um, uh, from other activities of the IDFC group. From IDFC alternatives perspective, it has the virtue of creating um, a structure that then sits alongside the bank balance sheet, not underneath the bank balance sheet. Um, and, and, and I think from a point of view of uh, you know, I know these issues loom mind in uh, large and uh, several LPs minds. The issues of conflict management actually between a balance sheet and the alternative fr franchise, those issues actually become um, much less um, uh, from a structural organizational point of view, uh, much less relevant because you don't have a balance sheet that is the owner of IDFC alternatives. It's just a, 
um, a holding company. Um, and so uh, we expect that um, um, uh, this legal structure transformation will be complete um, by September of 2015. Uh, we will launch our banking operations um, 1st of October 2015. Um, and we expect that um, a, a, the working relationship uh, between um, IDFC, IDFC Bank, and IDFC Alternatives um, will actually become more streamlined and will be much more effective than it has been in the past. So if you then look at what IDFC Group will look like come October 1st, 2015, they said you have a holding company that will be the listed entity, you'll have a bank, you'll have the Alternatives franchise, you have a public markets focused mutual fund, you have a niche securities company, um, and these will be um, essentially um, uh, the major uh, components um, of IDFC Group that will continue to have the complementarities that strategically um, we, have, we have looked for. So I'll, I'll, give you, I'll leave you with one, one example um, of con concrete uh, complementarity that will become even stronger than what we had in the past. Um, and that has to do with the fact that, again, the balance sheet will no longer sit on top of IDFC alternatives. As a bank, the balance sheet activities of IDFC are going to be much more tightly regulated than they have been as an NBFC. So IDFCs uh, or the bank's ability to do certain types of trades um, is going to be much more constrained. So there's a whole class of assets, for example, um, structured credit that IDFC bank will not be able to do. Um, uh, uh, whereas in the current context, um, there would have been, if you, if you like, uh, some competition between IDFC and IDFC alternatives for a structured credit kind of product. In the new structure, it will be a perfect complement to imagine having IDFC alternatives entering a new asset class, so uh, building along the lines of what we've done, let's say, in the real estate debt fund. Uh, we could create a, 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 a fund that is focused on structured credit um, that has absolutely zero overlap or competition with IDFC Bank. So uh, I hope I've given you a flavor for um, what to expect. I can only once again reassure you that as a platform, as a management team, um, we are committed um, to driving IDFC alternatives um, to their next level, and we very much look forward um, to your support in getting there. Thank you very much.